you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us on this webinar. I hope everybody's keeping safe and well in these strange times that we're all facing. Um, just a quick one around if for some reason modern technology fails us, uh, we will reconnect straight away. Uh, I gather that most people are probably still working from home at this moment in time. So um, today we'll be talking about how critical it is to ensure your data is prepared for a successful SAP migration. I'll be kicking off the webinar with an agenda run through shortly and a high level introduction to proceed. And there will be three sections to this webinar that will be delivered by myself and my two colleagues that are shown on the uh, front presentation slide. Um, so next slide, please. Thanks, Michelle. So as you can see on the agenda, as I've just noted, there's three sections to this. The first one, which I'll run through, will be SAP data management, um, how to save costs when migrating to S4 and or the cloud. And then we'll hand over to my colleague, Muko, who will be uh, going through BW. And then also on to my other colleague, Robert Rubin, who will be going through the legacy system decommissioning. Um, just to note that there's a question uh, and answers at the end of the presentation, but if you would like to ask any questions, there's um, a chat box on go to meetings. So please do feel free to add your questions at any time. Next slide, please, Michelle. So first slide about proceeds. We have um, over 20 years experience uh, with working with SAP and SAP archiving. Uh, as the ILM product has evolved, uh, Proceed has had a hand in the evolution of the software. Um, Proceed are effectively an extension of SAP. We have unrivaled access into SAP and that's mostly through the fact that um, we have a large pool of ILM consultants more than actually SAP do themselves. And because of that and the work that we do with SAP, we're seen as very trusted by SAP. And we also have a hand in the software um, roadmap. So we have direct access to the development team um, that look after ILM. And um, we probably do around 50, 60% of our work is done through SAP. For being such a small business, and you will see on later slides, the companies that we deal with um, are enterprise level. Um, and we probably have dealt with 90% of the FTSE 100 and probably, I would say, 80, 90% of the larger SAP clients in the world and have helped them with the, their archiving um, issues and problems. Um, so we actually have quite a large presence in South Africa. Um, so my colleague Muku is on the, on the webinar. She runs the South African business for us. Um, so we're headquartered in the United Kingdom, but we're a global business. We have, um, uh, we have, um, a region in America. Um, that uh, looks after the archiving, decommission and content management over in the States. Um, we have over 200 plus HANA migrations under our belt and, and over 600 customers, which we'll go into. But there's three main parts of our business and what we offer. It's around archiving services, decommissioning services, which also includes non-SAP system decommissioning and also content management service predominantly around open text next slide please michelle and as i just stated for such a small business um we have some really good references out in the marketplace where we've helped companies with their archiving issues and problems um we also have which is good to know relationships with most of the large system integrators who we call partners and clients. Next slide, please, Michelle. <clears throat> Again, uh, some quite large SAP users that we've dealt with there. Next slide, please, Michelle. Right, okay, so why is data management? Um, as we all know, 
we have lots of um, data in SAP systems and in order to make the system run smoothly and also from a regulatory perspective and also a cost saving perspective it's good sometimes to remove the rubbish from your SAP system and this is what we try to do and have been successful in doing with SAP users. Next slide please Michelle. This is a typical process to start your, your data archiving journey. There's four main steps. So there's avoidance, which is do nothing. Um, we have are engaged with a large um, UK large bank at the moment that has um, 20 years worth of data within their ECC system that hasn't been touched. Um, and I think kind of the reason why they've not touched it is because no one in their business wanted to be the person to kick off the process due to um, potentially deleting archiving something that the bank may need for say legal reasons. Um, so we're currently helping them with, with, with that problem. So the summarization, sure that's an option, but again, it's a what if scenario. The deletion, not all of your data can be deleted. There are rules around how long you should keep the data. And then it goes into archiving. There will come a point where you will have to start to think about archiving. Uh, business don't like the thought of archiving, but proceed, take the unknown, show with our experience how easy and doable it actually all is whilst keeping the correct data in place and access for any eventuality. Next slide, please, Michelle. <clears throat> so here is um, a slide around uh, what's in a toolbox. So it's mostly underpinned by our experience and knowledge of over 600, helping 600 plus SAP clients. Um, and also our IP, so our software that we've built over the years that fills a lots of gaps that we've come up against and speeds up uh, the process of a project that we get involved in and to make sure that it's on budget and it's also on time. Next slide, please, Michelle. So one of those um, pieces of software that we've developed is something called Riotizer. Um, so this is making sure, this piece of software makes sure that you correctly size your SAP data estate before the move to HANA. And this is quite critical. The ramifications of not doing this before any project commencement is a surefire way of going over budget and extending the time to the HANA platform. There are many horror stories around out there that S4 moves go wrong and upon investigation it's down to the data not being correctly sized. So it's a very fine line that you have to walk between undersizing and oversizing it. Um, if done correctly, your HANA platform will grow as projected rather than run away with itself. So next slide please, Michelle. So we all know or should know that HANA gives you some fantastic benefits around compression and, and the tooling that comes with it. Um, and we've been instrumental in helping a number of SAP customers in the move to S4 uh, and into HANA platform. Next slide, please, Michelle. So Proceed have built the tool that enables you to see what if scenarios for your new S4 platform. The right size of tool gives you the ability to see a blueprint phase. So we run the an analysis tool and out the back of that, you actually get um, a report and we can up or downsize that to fit your requirements, basically. Um, it means that the user is able to go back into the business and show the report that's produced out the back of the software being run. SAP quite like this because um, it helps customers move into S4, into a HANA platform. Next slide, please, Michelle. So here is some typical costs around appliances and also some high level costings around savings. Um, if you get the um, the data estate correctly sized before the project move into HANA. SAP users are sometimes put off by the move to HANA because sometimes, and this is wrongly assumed, that it's expensive. So right size shows the art of the possible. The savings are also big on cloud options also. Um, so this is an appliance slide 
but then there's also customers want to have the cloud option as well and see the savings that they can have in the cloud right size of works with the cloud offerings as well next slide please michelle this graph just shows you three scenarios of data growth, volume and growth. It's very plain to see that archiving with retention management gives you a static manageable system. Next slide, please, Michelle. So just touching on some references uh, that we have. This uh, is one of the largest tire manufacturers in the world. You can probably guess which one. Um, we're currently in flight with a global uh, project to help um for their pre um hana migration uh, which is going globally so they're doing it piecemeal by region i think at the moment they're in asia pack and then they're coming to europe uh, by the end of the year but the savings because they've used right size it is significant as you can see next slide please michelle so this is what we've actually uh, done for them and what we've achieved um through using again the tool next slide please michelle and then there's also capita that we've uh, helped to get into their hana s4 system um just a bit of a view in terms of capita and then also uh, what we did for them next slide please michelle So the do's and don'ts when it comes to data archiving, um, do right size to build an archive strategy. Start small with a technically, technical archiving and housekeeping, get the experts in to do the work because it is extremely um, difficult to do. And you do need somebody that has experience because it can become quite a mess if not. Um, so don't. You know, think about archiving as a don't think about archiving as a one-off exercise it's got to be continuous and if it isn't given the attention um it can run away with itself and you could be potentially back to square one um i would suggest not to do a big bang bang approach to start with take one system at a time and that's also good from spreading the cost as well um that's my section done I've got a finite amount of time to get through this. So there's three sections. So I want to hand over to my colleague, Muku. Thank you so much, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Moho. And as Paul has introduced me, I basically run the Proceed Group's South African operations. And today I'm going to be discussing SAP BW, um, or should we now say BW for HANA data volumes management um, in readiness for your migration? Okay. One of the biggest issues that a lot of customers face is the rapidly grow growing BW database. And that happens a lot. And most of the times, the data growth impacts system performance. And we get a lot of customers saying, we have SAP HANA, we've already upgraded to S um, SAP S4 HANA, we've got a, a Ferrari, but it's not moving as fast. But the underlying problem is usually the data that's causing that Ferrari not to run faster. So as a result, there's growing maintenance that happens, um, and obviously um, that is a big problem. Okay. So we're going to be um, unpacking how do you manage your data growth within your BW environment, as well as your BW for HANA. Okay. BW, we all know it's an enterprise data warehouse um, and it's always connected to various source system types depending on uh, your organization, what applications you have. Now in BW, you have different areas that you could potentially look at that could be contribu contributing towards your data growth in your enterprise data warehouse. And we've got, we know PSA tables are quite big with SAP BW, but now with BW for HANA, SAP has gone away with PSA tables, which is a good thing. Uh, with BW for HANA, we are going to be working a lot with advanced data store objects, 
and obviously we also need to look into those um, tables of ADSOs that grow um, rapidly. As we all know, the ADSOs have got three types of tables, either active table, change log table, or um, an inbound table. And usually the active table will be the one that will have a lot of data that will need to be um, archived should the data be managed. Other tables can be managed through normal housekeeping tasks. Classic DSOs, this is, is in a scenario where you have a BW system um, that's basically been replaced by ADSOs, so same concept there. Info cubes, we no longer speak of info cubes in BW for HANA, but now um, we do have an ADSO of type info cubes that's been introduced, so we also need to look at that growth um, there. Your DB statistics um, as well, that's something that needs to be um, also managed very carefully, including the logs as well. And lastly, depending on your organization, if you have implemented the LSA layered architecture on your enterprise data warehouse, you need to look at how many layers you can actually apply in your environment. So if you're applying all the LSA layers, that is a problem. You need to strategically look at what layers are relevant for your solutions um, and which ones you will use in your organization. So this is always a case where data is duplicated a number of times in different layers and all, we need to look into that as well. So these are all the different causes that can cause um, your data growth in your typical enterprise data warehouse. Let's talk a little bit about the data management evolution. So data management, you basically have two um, areas. You can either manage your data through um, data archiving, and data archiving, with that we have a new product. It's, it's not really new, it's just, um, it's been there for quite some time. Proceed Group, we do specialize in this area, SAP Formation Lifecycle Management, and it's one of the tools that we use to basically um, archive the data, retain the data. Um, as well as decommission. So it's got different functionalities that gets applied to it. Now, in the sense of BW case, we're talking about data aging. We know that every day when you transact as a business, your data um, loses sort of like value in terms of time. Uh, and that's why in BW, we have two functions. In this case, I'm referring to BW for HANA. In BW, you have what we know as NLS, which is the nearline storage uh, that's been there for, for many, many years. And now with BW for HANA, it's introducing DTO, data tiering optimization. This feature is going to be replacing NLS in future, but for now with BW for HANA 2.0, you can still use NLS specifically for complex data archiving scenarios or specifically only for the cold store um, function. But DTO is basically the new way to go. Okay. Right, let's just quickly unpack what are the benefits of BW data volume management. Ultimately, the objective is you need to reduce your data footprint. The data that has grown um, over time, um, you need to eventually reduce it so you can have a fast and running system all the time. Now with that, you can reduce a lot of your storage cost, um, especially if you um, uh, um, going to be looking into storage space, etc., and eliminating your storage costs. Um, you can also have a linear system um, when you have a linear system, you've already archived your data, you've managed your data volumes, you've segregated the data accordingly, you only have the data that you need to move to either cloud or, or on-prem as BW4 HANA solution, it's going to make the migration very easier for you. Because a lot of migration projects, they fail because of um, a lot of issues relating to incomplete data and unnecessary data that is moved across to, to the environment that's causing problems. So this will definitely help you with that. Another thing that customers need to know is when you do manage or reduce your data volume in your enterprise data warehouse, 
um, it results in you having to save costs in terms of your SEPHANA appliance, it becomes way cheaper when you do it that way. Instead of just, if you're sitting with a 10 terabyte BW system and you're migrating all that data, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Whereas if you've managed the data and you've archived the data, you can reduce your box from 10 terabyte to about 2 terabyte and you only pay for the 2 terabyte hardware appliance. Okay, so it's massive cost savings there. And also, customers that are not ready to really move to BW4 HANA as yet, they tend to first look at the data volume management to try to reduce um, the data and also to ultimately get the system to perform a little bit faster, um, i.e. the process chain is running a bit quicker and the query is running a bit faster. So that's also one of the benefits of data volume management in your enterprise data warehouse. Right, so BW for HANA going forward, we're now talking data aging strategies. When you look at this, it's basically analysts. Okay, it's basically analysts. Um, so with BW for HANA, you've got three different types of um, storage um, areas that you can segregate your data. Okay, so the hot data, we know that the hot data is where your actual active live business value data is stored and it's stored in SAP HANA, okay? And this is all the data that you run that you need um, all the time. Then we have what we call warm data. Now the warm data is stored in a dedicated HANA extension node. So it's sort of separated from the actual HANA database. It's got its own dedicated area, okay? And with that, um, you store your warm data and there's much more storage capacity um, on the warm data side. Then the cold data is when you're storing data outside your HANA database, which you can either use IQ or Hadoop, um, et cetera. And this data is sitting outside. Now with BW4 HANA, Whenever you need to report on call, call data, specifically for data compliance, or you're having an audit and they need to look at data that's a little bit older, this is the area where you're going to be um, reporting on that data. You don't have to move your data back in again in order for you to read that data. You can do it directly, which I'll show you guys um, shortly. So these are all the three different data aging strategies. These options are now mandatory. So when you are in BW for HANA and creating your ADSOs, it will ask you which storage area are you setting the ADSO for. And through that, you'll be able to specify either hot, warm, or cold. Okay. Um, and just to add on that, you also need to be a little bit um, um, ahead in terms of planning because you can have an ADSO and say, okay, this ADSO, um, it needs to store data from year one to year three, but I'm also planning to adjust it to move it to warm data after certain years. So you can do that either manually or schedule it by via process chain. Okay, so BW for HANA has ensured that all the activities relating to data management is applied during modeling. Okay, so let's quickly have a look for analysts. Analysts, SAP kept analysts for BW4 HANA because um, some customers were, active, were actively using BW analysts from the previous versions um, 7.4 or 7.5. Now with that, um, analysts is still available, but it is a solution only for cold store, okay? Um, and it's also utilized a lot if you still have a lot of data archiving um, scenarios. But this was done specifically for those customers that were still utilizing it heavily. Um, obviously, SAP IQ is your nearline storage. There is an adapter that's available and delivered with BW for HANA. Uh, because of analysts, we know that in the past, we you have to always create your data archiving process, files, etc. So still similar process applies in this case. And data and LNS can be read directly, either using queries without having to be reloaded back again, which is a good thing. And now with the BW4 HANA, 
you can access the data in your SEP IQ via your SDA. So this is your SEP HANA Smart Data Access, one of the new source system type connections that you can use. Um, and then for your ADSOs, you can store data in nearline storage using a um, DAP. Um, and storing data in nearline storage obviously reduces the data volume um, of your info providers, in this case ADSOs, but the data will still be available for queries. And again, they're re-emphasizing that you don't have to load the data back into BW for HANA once you've moved it to a cold store. Okay. Now the new functionality, date, data tiering optimization. In future, it is going to be um, replacing NLS. Um, it's basically a new future, and this allows you to basically optimize um, your memory footprint of data in BW for HANA and stream, streamline it, um, thereby it will re, um, reduce your total cost of ownership. It is solely based on advanced DSOs, so every time you create an advanced DSOs, like I said, you need to specify which area it is. You can also do temperature maintenance and set it during your modeling. Okay. And then you obviously have to classify your data, as I've said, either hot, warm, or cold for that particular ADSO that you'll be creating, and data will be stored in those different storage areas. And DTO provides a central user interface, which I'll show you guys shortly, where you can have all your storage options set. And then lastly, SAP has introduced a new process type, which you can incorporate in your process chains so that you can change um, or adjust the data tiering to move it from hot to warm or cold. So it's no longer a manual process. So you can have that already set up in your environment. Okay. All right. So this is the new BW4 HANA cockpit. Now a lot has changed with BW4 HANA. Obviously we're no longer going to be using RSA1. There's still some functionalities relation, in relation to administration that's still available um, in your GUI, but ultimately all your maintenance, all your creations, everything's moved onto the cockpit. As you can see, um, SAP provides you with different tabs of the cockpit and they are heavily focusing on data management and data protection and privacy. As you can see here on this section here, you will be able to do your data tiering maintenance, manage your partitions that you've created, and basically see all the available um, storage areas that you have set. So data management has become an uh, integral part um, of your BW4 HANA system, so it needs to be taken very seriously. So this is the new view now that um, we'll be working on. Okay, then. As we all know, in the past, BW7X, I'm referring to any version from 7.0 up until 7.5. This is how um, the architecture used to be like. You used to have your BW database and all your info providers, and obviously with the, your sub nearline provider and the nearline services, as well as the analyst repository that you were using to store your call data. And obviously, through this process, you would create your data archiving process, and from there, you could do your, um, your querying and your reporting from there. Obviously, you would specify that the data needs to, um, from the query, needs to read data from certain um, DSOs as well. And then you could also utilize multi-providers or composite providers to the later versions where you can read um, data as well. Now, the new architecture of BW4 HANA is slightly different. Um, so what you see here is basically DTO, which is only applicable to BW4 HANA. And there on your left-hand side, you will see you have an ADSO either set to hot or warm. You can do your partitioning and your temperature schema. Basically, temperature schema, you can do it either partition level or object level, obviously focusing on the different air storage areas. Then in the middle, you have your data tiering optimization functionality, which you can use um, for, for managing that. Um, it does still use DAP runtime in the back end. And here is the connection where you want to connect to your call store because it's sitting outside your HANA. So you can use the SDA to do your data transfer 
transfers. And at the bottom, we have NLS for those customers that are still on BW on HANA and BW for HANA. And here you can do your partitioning, still your ADSOs either hot or warm, um, but you can still use your data archiving process and create those files. And then basically you can do file-based data transfer between that and your cold store. Okay, so this is sort of like um, the recent architecture for now. All right. Now, next one, we're going to be talking about data uh, protection and privacy. We also call it DPP. Now, ILM is a product that has always been there from SAP, and it's got different functionality. As I said, you can do archiving with ILM, you can do retention management where you basically automate your whole entire archiving process and integrate it with your overall organization data retention policies. You can also decommission your SAP and non-SAP systems. But in this case, we're talking about the ILM integration with BW. So when you have an active license on your either your ERP system or even your S4 HANA, um, you can still utilize the services of ILM where when you are personally look, using this functionality, whatever gets archived on S4 HANA or whatever gets deleted on S4 HANA, the notification gets sent through to BW. So you are able to see what objects have been deleted because that would need to be flagged on the BW side. So it's quite a good functionality. So SAP is pushing for data protection and privacy. It is there, the functionality is there, and you can basically manage this whole ILM integration through the BW4 HANA cockpit. So the situation today, personal data is increasingly protected by laws, i.e. we know the GDPR policy um, that's applicable for the um, for Europe and as well as the South African um, legislation, which is similar, the Poppy Act, the Personal Protection Information Act, that recently came into effect from 1st of July. Um, companies have up until, I think, 373 days to comply, and that's just to ensure that um, you are um, taking action against your um, personal data. BW4HANA does offer those um, capabilities, as I've said, and ILM ensures retention management in your operational system, and it's used to support data protection and privacy compliance from a BW perspective as well with the integration. Up to recently, BW was not necessarily informed when data was deleted from the source using ILM, but now that functionality is there through the data protection privacy. The challenge, how can we better support customers to delete replicated personal SAP data in BW after the end of purpose? Um, that was one of the biggest challenge. But now, with this new data protection and privacy functionality, a lot has changed. Okay. So we have what we call data protection workbench. This is basically available on UBW for HANA. So all the events that happen on the ILM side, um, whether it's deletion of data, like I've said, all that data will get sent through to BW. So how this works, on your right-hand side, you'll see your ERP system where you'll have your um, ILM archiving um, deletion process in place, and all that ILM notification data will sit in a certain table in ERP, and that will get connected through your BW extractors or data sources, and you'll have to link your ILM object to your data source and to the field and the notifications will get sent um, through to your ADSOs. And this you manage it through the data protection um, workbench in BW for HANA. So you are able to see um, what happens from an archiving perspective on ERP side on ILM. So it's um, you persist notifications from ILM into BW for HANA um, ADSOs, seamless integration into Fiori-based cockpit, the BW4 cockpit, um, grouping of notifications into work lists. Um, obviously, you can also identify your info providers. Um, obviously, if you have a certain area, so it will have a data flow, so you need to, uh, you can have a look at that. And this will also um, record documentation of all the work list processing status, and that's particularly for legal auditing purposes. So it is an integrated solution to consistently delete replicated data, and that will allow to reduce a lot of administration effort. Okay, all right, let me just go to the next slide. 
Okay, so these are all the capabilities of data protection and privacy in BW. Um, as you can see, all these functions here, it's basically ILM um, capabilities. So read access logging, you can monitor all the, um, uh, uh, the read access for sensitive data. Um, obviously, there's uh, restrictions in terms of authorizations where um, there is authorizations applied to that, not just everybody can do that. There is an information report that will get sent out um, that can allow you to analyze usage of sensitive information, where used, master data, etc. And obviously, the deletion of personal data as well. Um, once you get that notification, you are able to selectively delete that data from your ADSO that has been deleted from your S4 HANA site um, through ILM. Okay, and you can obviously look at where used, list, and all of that that contain the values. Obviously, this is a sensitive exercise. That's where there is authorizations in place because somebody needs to do this. And then you can also automate this through process chains. Um, you could also track all the changes to master data, transactional data, and there will be audit and change logs available. And then the workbench, obviously, that's sort of like a, basically where a place to go for you to check all your notifications um, that came through the ILM processes, and um, you can replicate your notifications from ILM to BW, and the workbench obviously supports all the identified info providers containing the sensitive data, as well as what needs to be selectively deleted. So these are all the functions of DPP. So one of the big questions, how do we configure this? So from a BW's perspective, um, there is a customizing area where you can go and set up the ILM notification key. All you do, you specify the ILM object um, as well as the source table and the source field. Then you need to link that to your data sources, okay? Um, and then obviously specify um, whether it's active or it's going to be processed or whatnot. And then obviously here you'll have a view of what you've mapped. So from the ILM table through to the ILM object field through to the data source field. As you can see, um, you need to have this full mapping um, in place and already configured from a BW side. Okay. All right, and then let's just quickly go to the next screen. All right, customizing transactions. Once you activate, um, um, you have your um, your ILM um, objects. You activate them. You can check the key, and you can also maintain exclusion lists for those that need to be excluded. And you can just activate your data source um, mappings. So this is something that can be done um, through the configuration in BW. Okay. All right. And what does the notification contain when you receive that data protection notification? It's the source system where it's coming from. It's the, the data provider, which is your extractor or your data source used to transfer the data to BW4HANA. It's the type of mode that the data is coming through. Is it archived data or is it deleted data? Because that will give you an indication of what actions you need to take in BW4HANA. The key of the actual master data objects with the corresponding field names. Obviously, this will be in JSON format. Um, the notification object that um, that's related to the ILM process and the event that generated the notification, so you can trace back. And obviously, the technical ID that identifies the protection notification as well as the time step in terms of when it was blocked, the expiration date, and on the actual notification. All right, and that's it. I think that's it from my side. I'm going to hand over to Robert Rubin. He's going to be covering the um, how to keep control of your SAP data landscape costs. From me, thank you. All right, thank you, Moko, and thank you, Paul. So yes, I'm going to be talking about uh, system decommissioning, where that fits. So uh, just to step back and let, let's talk about where we are in terms of migration. So today's webinar is about migrations of SAP systems and, and Paul has covered Brownfield where you're moving your older system to a new S4 landscape, but you're, you're taking everything with you. Uh, and the value obviously you described of archiving uh, is critical there. Uh, and in fact, there's a, there's a couple of points I wanted to, to add really. One, one is that we often get questioned by, by uh, customers when we're, we're discussing uh, archiving 
around uh, is when, when you archive, is the data still visible? And this is the key concern from end users. So I know many of you will understand this, but often end users don't understand this, and it's their biggest fear with archiving. Uh, and the key point is that when we uh, archive data with SAP ILM, that data is still visible. So all the transactions and reports that you're used to running will still run, you'll still see that data. It's just been moved to much lower cost storage and taken out of your core system so you don't have to, to include that when you're sizing for, for HANA or for the uh, the cloud platform that you're on. So that's a really uh, important point and, and one of the great values of, uh, of the archiving that Paul described. Um, and also, as we've heard, often when people are moving to, to S4, they're also uh, may have already moved towards one of the cloud providers for their infrastructure or are planning to do so. And again, the, the, uh, the benefits of, uh, uh, of doing archiving and taking data out uh, are very significant. So we see customers who are saving literally uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds a year or even more uh, in their costs of their uh, hyperscaler platform by doing archiving. Uh, and, and that often enables the project to be justified in the first place. So that, that's all around brownfield. And today I'm gonna now move on to talk about greenfield migration. So we, we see a fairly even split amongst our customers between a brownfield and a greenfield scenario. And, and clearly a greenfield is where customers are implementing a new S4 system. And they're going to just take across the, the key data that they need, often open items or just the last two, two years data. So what we will see them do is to do some archiving into ILM uh, of all the older uh, operational data and any technical data. That can be then kept in, in the ILM retention warehouse. And then there's different ways of handling that. That can be, um, that can be accessed independently and reporting can be done directly through that, or that can be attached to an S4 system in the future to allow, to allow access. So Greenfield, we're really talking about decommissioning. So once that move has been done to S4, the new system has been implemented, then it's about decommissioning of the old systems. That's what I'm going to cover in a bit more detail now. So, if Michelle, if you can move on to the, the next slide. So let's, let's just step back a little bit, because decommissioning is often a topic that is a little bit less familiar to people uh, than archiving. So I'm just going to give some background on, on decommissioning. Uh, so decommissioning is is all about retiring systems, uh, typically legacy systems. Um, but the key point here is that there's there's often data in those systems. There's a reason why they need to be retained, why that data is still important to the organization. So decommissioning needs to be done in a way that that data is still accessible to the business. And here we're talking, we are talking about legacy applications. When you've done a migration, you've moved on to your new platform, uh, whether it may be a migration onto Suite on HANA, uh, or obviously now more, more, more frequently will be a move to S4 HANA. If you've got ECC systems left behind of any sort, whether it's uh, ERP, uh, SRM, CRM, uh, it's about being able to uh, take the data out of those legacy applications. So we mean, when we say legacy, it's about applications that have been replaced. Uh, there's typically going to be no new data added, but that data still needs to be accessed because it's still delivering value to the business. So uh, moving to the next slide, please, Michelle. So the priority here is very much about the data. Okay. And there's a number of steps that need to be looked at uh, when you're doing decommissioning before that any, any systems can be decommissioned. Obviously, there's some work to do to understand what data is in the source system. How, how many years of data, how much data, how many terabytes we're talking about. Uh, what's what value of that data? Um, you know, we can do a similar assessment to the, the the right sizing that Paul described. And if there's data that's of no value, that can be deleted. Uh, if there's value, data that is still of value, then of course that has to be preserved and taken across. So there's there's some analysis work needs to be done. Uh, there's some consideration about um, where you're going to store the data going forward, um, making sure that it's in uh, a modern, secure, accessible repository. Uh, because typically legacy systems may well be on older hardware, uh, maybe on older levels of uh, the operating system or database or the application. Um, we often find people are running on such old levels that they are no longer supported or not, not even getting security patches through. So those are all real concerns that by moving the data into a, a more modern repository, uh, we get away from those, those issues. Uh, increasingly, we are looking at um, 
uh, both a choice uh, to be a choice of cloud platform for repositories. Uh, many people have uh, decided that uh, they're going to make the move from on-premise to cloud. So that's a, an important uh, consideration. And then we have to think about reporting. And reporting is a big piece of, uh, of any decommissioning project, you know, understanding from your users what reports they will need, uh, but often um, making sure that what they're asking for is something that's achievable. It's not realistic to have uh, uh, thousands of reports accessible. So there has to be a piece of work to, uh, to agree the right set of reports. Okay. And then when we look at some of the, the benefits or the drivers for doing the decommissioning piece of work, I think in, a, in any migration project, it's a little bit more obvious. You know, if you're moving to a new system, uh, typically uh, it makes sense to, to decommission the old, but, but it's, we do see scenarios where people have hung on to older uh, systems, even though they have a new one in place. So what are, what are some of the reasons for doing it? Um, obviously cost is often thought of as the first one, uh, continuing to pay for, um, hardware and, and hardware that may need upgrades every few years, uh, continue to pay support costs for that hardware and for each of the levels of software in the software stack, uh, and all the staff costs uh, are, are very substantial. So cost is often a driver for doing decommissioning. But actually, when we talk to customers, uh, many of the business risks associated with, with continuing to run older systems uh, come to the foreground. And as I've already mentioned, uh, some of the things about uh, the issues around being unsupported um, or not even getting security patches are a very major concern. Um, you know, we often see customers who choose to keep legacy systems um, available, but only turn them on when they're actually needed, um, which in itself is quite a risk because uh, turning on and off systems, especially older systems frequently just adds further risk uh, that they may not come on when you need them. Uh, and indeed, we often see older systems are not compliant. So uh, Rocco has already mentioned uh, GDPR and Poppy. Um, often older applications are not compliant with those or, or other new regulations. Uh, so again, further business risk. So obviously cost and risk are two of the, the, the main drivers for doing decommissioning. Uh, but there are others, uh, some examples I've, I've listed here. Clearly when staff are working on keeping older applications going, uh, and doing the work required to maintain and, and report on them. Uh, they are not working on something that is a little bit more strategic, uh, that is a, of a more immediate priority to the business. Um, and another factor that's worth considering is that many, many organizations we work with have got some sort of environmental objectives. They want to, to be greener. They want to you know, go carbon free or plastic free. Um, and when we look at uh, older systems, often they are getting much um, poorer performance uh, compared with new systems, uh, the amount of electricity they require is much higher per, uh, per, per unit of performance or compute. Uh, and by moving on to a, a newer platform, you're getting much better results with a smaller impact on the environment. So that, that's another consideration that people, people care about. Okay, moving on, please, Michelle. So there's, let's, let's come back to the business case for decommissioning. Um, some headline numbers. So these are these are very uh, very much average numbers that we see, but typically uh, it can be 15% or it can be actually quite a bit more than that uh, of any organization's IT budget is spent on on legacy systems, and that can be quite substantial when we when we look at the large organizations we are dealing with. So anything that can reduce that cost uh, is worth considering. But in fact, we find that. Uh, doing a decommissioning project, uh, it can be as much as 80% uh, cost saving or T TCO saving uh, from doing a well-run project. Uh, and when you start to look at doing decommissioning of multiple systems, again, that can really add up. So the business case is often um, very compelling for doing a, a decommissioning project. And especially in these days when everyone is focused on uh, cost, that's, uh, that, that's a major focus. Um, we do have a model, uh, I won't go through it in detail today, but a model where we look at all the elements of cost from your existing systems, all the elements of cost from doing a decommissioning project and what uh, you will have to pay for for ongoing access to, to, to the data, uh, and that can, that can quickly show uh, the business case. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please, Michelle. Uh, and indeed, when there are lots of systems to decommission, um, we have a factory approach. We've done this with a number of customers where um, we will work through the systems uh, uh, you know, one by one, but starting with often the most complex so that lessons are learned. And then we find that the cost savings from doing the first one are often more than enough to pay for the, the project to do the second one and so on. 
So you actually get into a, you know, a virtuous cycle where effectively decommissioning the next system is paid for by the previous one. So it's effectively a free project. So it's a, it's a good position to be in, something we find does work very well. OK, moving on. So I'll briefly talk about uh, decommissioning uh, the, the, the how as well as the why. Um, we always start with a discovery phase when we're doing decommissioning because uh, there are so many variables with any particular customer's uh, IT estate. Um, this is where we will look at the systems they've got in place. We'll look at them in detail. Uh, we will look at uh, uh, the, the, the data, how much data volumes there are, what data there is there. We'll look at the reporting requirements. We'll look at the, uh, the platform requirements going forward, where they want to store the data, uh, all the things we've listed here, and, and start to be able to pull all that together. And then we can work with the customer to really lay out the steps required to do the full project. And moving forward. And then really a decommissioning project is like any other project. There's a, there's a whole set of cr critical success factors that need to be considered. Uh, and critically, I would say is that we, this needs to be looked at as not a technical project. It's very much one that involves the business. You know, the business has been using the applications that we're talking about for uh, often for many years. Uh, if we're going to take that away from them, uh, we need to make sure that they are reassured and understand that they'll still be able to access the data they need. Uh, that does require uh, all of the things we've written down here, and we need to make sure there is the right uh, executive sponsorship, the right communications going on, the right level of, of interaction and workshops is being held with the users to make sure that uh, the project is a success. Okay, moving on, Michelle. So in terms of how we do this, uh, there's a couple of solutions that we uh, we would generally use. Uh, we've already heard about SAP ILM, in, uh, which is, is valuable in terms of archiving and indeed can can be a, a key tool for system decommissioning. Um, equally, we've now got a tool of, uh, of our own from ProSQL Proceed Seller, which can work very well with ILM. The two are very complementary, uh, and that can offer uh, you know, enhanced and, and out-of-the-box reporting. So we often find that the two together uh, often the, offer the, the best solution for a full decommissioning project. But again, we will work with any customer to look at uh, what is required for them, and what is the best fit. And moving on. So I'm just going to run through some case studies before we wrap up. Um, these highlight a few things. So one, one is that um, uh, when we look at SAP, uh, there is complexity in doing SAP system decommissioning. It's not something that uh, you know, general decommissioning tools can, can handle. Uh, and in particular, the tools we've highlighted do understand um, the data model in SAP and can do these sorts of projects. So, you know, for example, with this large food production business, which was actually based in Canada, um, this was a scenario where they were divesting a division. So not so much a migration case study, but a, a, a divestment case study. Uh, they had to uh, delete a number of applications and take a large amount of data out. And that, again, was something we could do for them. A um, uh, second example was this pharmaceutical company that had a number of SAP systems. But this also highlights that the technologies we're talking about can handle non-SAP, uh, so they did the SAP systems first and they came back and decommissioned 55 JD Edward systems. So uh, the technologies we're looking at uh, can handle all of these and whether you're looking at doing decommissioning as part of a migration or you know, just it's a business priority in itself, um, the technology works very well across all of those. Okay, so I think if we move on, I'll just wrap up. So uh, I think Thank you for your time. I think we've covered all of the, uh, the different scenarios today, both across Brownfield, Greenfield, and of course, BW that's relevant in all, in all of these. And I'll, I'll hand back to Michelle. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Michael and uh, Paul. Um, <clears throat> so we have um, a few minutes now for que uh, questions. So um, you can put them into the chat or ask them now. Uh, we do have a few, so I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, one question is, the first question is, uh, what's the difference between a uh, quick sizer and right sizer? Hello? Okay, I'll, I can answer that. Okay, so the quick sizer is the one that SAP uses and that looks at your overall um, database size, how big it is, um, and it's 
basically just high level to give a status of your database. Um, the right size are, on the other hand, that's a proceed group tool that goes a little bit more detail. So it gives you your overall database size, which tables are higher. Um, it, it, it's also good in terms of looking at your actual data, whether your data is business complete, because you do get um, certain, let's say, POs that are still open that couldn't be finalized. So it looks at the whole um, transactional data business completion, um, and it also, um, it does um, allow you to close certain open items so that you are able to move on. So it's a little bit more comprehensive because it looks at the actual data. That's the right sizer. Thank you, Mokko. Um, second question is, um, <clears throat> what, what is the um, best, what is best to, um, to implement first, BW or ERP? Okay, so with that, it depends on your um, your roadmap within your organization. Um, we find some customers that move, that start with the BW4 HANA first and then do the S4 after, um, and you get others that sort of um, start with S4 HANA. So it really, really just depends on your roadmap that um, you've set aside for your organizations together with SAP. Thank you, Miko. And, um... Finally, just to have one come in. Uh, how do you start a typical decommissioning project? Uh, thanks, Michelle. So, um, generally, when we're doing a, a decommissioning project, we will all start with doing a discovery phase. Um, so, uh, obviously, the start of the engagement is much more pre sales activity. We will be doing briefings and presentations about how it's done uh, and about the technology. But then once we get into the project, the discovery phase is critical. So that's really where we, we have our consultants come and uh, evaluate exactly what data the customer's got, really understand uh, the full requirements about the systems that are going to be decommissioned, uh, what data needs to be retained, what uh, reporting needs to be done, uh, the technology stack and what technology they want to, to, to have as the, the platform for uh, storing data going forward. Uh, for example, if we're using our island, there's choices between using um, a number of different technologies to store the data, whether it's the SAP IQ database that, that comes with an ILM license or open text is another choice. There are six or seven other third party storage options that are possible. And indeed, if people are using um, Amazon or Azure, um, there could be blob storage uh, on one of those, uh, those hyperscaler platforms. So there's a range of technology choices all of this needs to be considered in this discovery phase, and that's how we would start a project and then be able to map out the, the full project from there. Thank you, Robert.